two, one. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Van Reese, the chair of Metro's uh, Council's Parks, Libraries and Arts Committee. And uh, we have called um, a special presentation opportunity uh, for all of us to uh, hear from the key departments uh, on uh, things that are happening in Nashville. Um, there will be a series of six of these uh, one hour or less uh, presentations and conversations, uh, one every month, starting with parks here in October. Uh, in November, we will hear from libraries. In December, we will hear from arts. And then we'll repeat the process in January, February, and March of next year. The purpose of these conversations is for those of us on the committee, the Metro Council, and the general public to get a really good look at what is happening uh, in these departments uh, from inside the department. Um, there is no better situation uh, than now to be talking about what makes our city thrive and is valuable to all of us. And so I'm uh, more than happy uh, to welcome the uh, first of our series of presentations uh, Director Monique Odom, who will introduce her staff as appropriate and uh, provide to us some conversation uh, about Metro Parks and Rec. Uh, at the end of the presentation, if time allows, uh, committee members will be able to ask questions as it relates to the presentation. Um, this is being recorded and will be provided on the Metro Nashville uh, Network uh, YouTube channel. And I'm encouraging all the committee members to share it in as many ways and as creatively as possible so that the majority of those interested and those that should be interested in Metro Parks has this information as well. So with that, I'm going to mute and pass it over to Dr. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Council Member Van Rees. Uh, I always am glad for the opportunity to share of what our department is doing. I'm glad to be here today in particular to talk about parks in general and the Metro Parks Department um, specifically and specifically outside of um, the annual budget process. Normally that's the only opportunity unless we're having a one-on-one -on -one that we're able to talk about um, the good work of our department and, and what we do here in the city. Um, so I will get to the, the subject at hand. Um, our mission is to sustainably and equitably provide everyone in Nashville with an inviting network of parks and greenways that offer health, wellness, and quality of life through recreation and recreation, conservation, and community. And just so I set the table a little bit, when we talk about equity, we're talking about encouraging behaviors, systems, or policies to ensure fair and just treatment of all community members, regardless of race, background, ability, income, or beliefs. We know that one size does not fit all and that every individual starts on a different playing field. Creating opportunities that meet individuals where they are and address their unique needs is key to ensuring that all members of society are entitled to the same positive health outcomes. A community that prioritizes equity works to ensure that all community members have access to what they need to be successful and that resources are distributed based on need. We, sus we subscribe to the team concept here in the Parks Department. And our divisions are just that. They are many teams within our larger team. Our team consists of community recreation, consolidated maintenance, greenways and open spaces, outdoor recreation and environmental education, parks police, planning and revenue producing facilities. And I will uh, dive deeper into these um, individual divisions as we progress through the presentation want to talk a little bit about um, our revenue here in the Parks Department. We collect about $14 million 
uh, in, a, in a regular year. And of course, 2020 has not been a regular year for any of us. Uh, we collect $14 million per year um, in revenue, and that goes directly back to Metro's general fund. As you can see from this pie chart, our largest revenue collector or generator is golf. There are golf courses. And with those being weather dependent, um, you can guess that if uh, we the climate doesn't, um, doesn't cooperate with us, um, then that revenue will be down. Parthenon and Sportsplex follow after that. And I like to call those our top three. So they're our top three revenue generators. Then we have permits that could be a picnic, uh, picnic shelters, uh, space rentals, uh, space reservations, excuse me, um, and then airplane. Then we have special events. Uh, we do have special event staff here um, in the department that coordinate with uh, organizers of events. Um, we have a number, we uh, charge for some fees, some fees for classes and workshops. We have Wave Country, um, a water park that you all may be familiar with as a revenue uh, generating facility. And then our community centers, particularly our regional community centers that are fee based. So those are your larger uh, centers. Again, I'll talk about those later in the presentation. So if you take a look at our FY21 budget, the budget is about $43.3 million. And what normally happens when you um, tell people, um, give them your operating budget number, a number like $43 million seems like a very large number. For, but for a park system our size that spans the entire, um, the entire county, it's, um, it leaves us in want a lot. So I'll just whittle down and break this down for you. Um, so as most um, council members know, and some members of the public may know, uh, Metro budgets, generally operating budgets are broken down into three areas. That's salaries and benefits, which those two comprise personnel expenses. And then there's a category called other, and that is everything else other than salaries and benefits. Um, so our salary budget for this fiscal year is about 24, 0.7, almost $24.8 million. Um, that's about 57% of the budget. And then our fringes or benefits are about 8.7 million. So a total of the um, our personnel costs, which are the salaries and the fringes, that's about 77% of the budget, of our entire budget. So you see it is um, very heavy in personnel expenses. Then when we go down to all other, um, expenses, those expenses that I talked about that are um, everything except for um, salary, uh, personnel expenses. I, I hesitate to call them discretionary because a lot of times they are not discretionary expenses. Um, I ordinarily would call them that, but we're, we're not today. Um, so uh, in other, we have about 9.8, almost $10 million or 23% of our total operating budget. And so in other, there, what we have, we have utilities, that's about almost $3.6 million. Then we have internal service fees, which are fees that are paid or given back to our central service departments that provide service to other metro departments. So that is fleet, this general services, ITS, um, and then surplus property and radio shop are also um, general services departments. So that those amounts are given back to that department for their service to our department. Then we have um, transfers in and out. That's a small portion. It's just about $200,000. And that's basically for return to work pensioners and then some um, self-funded debt that has existed here that we're paying off. So after you take all of those out, down here where it says everything else. So you take all that out. We are left with about 3.6, let's say $3.6 million um, to uh, use over a 12 month period um, for this large uh, park system that spans the entire county. And if you break that down by month, divided by 12, it's $297, $297,000, excuse me, $825, so almost $300,000 per month. Let's just say that in um, air quotes, discretionary spending. 
And for those of you who do not know, there is a seasonality nature of parks. So our budget, uh, we have spending patterns. So as you may imagine, when um, it's spring and summer and the weather is nice, um, we have a lot of outdoor activities that are starting. Uh, for instance, wave country, that, that's a summertime um, event um, and all, uh, lots of outdoor activities and events that we start to have um, in the department. So we would not expand um, an equal amount across 12 months, just so you understand that. But anyway, back to this 3.6, roughly $3.6 million. Some of the things that come out of that money, uh, that chunk are, you know, telecommunications or telephones, temporary service, supplies for our custodians, uniforms, uh, vegetation control. So that's chemicals for um, a treatment for golf courses and things like that, supplies for recreation and other maintenance items. And all of those, I call those have tos. Those are things that we have to have to operate um, operate the, uh, the park system successfully. So you see, once you whittle down the $43 million, it's basically down to about 3.5, what we kind of have discretion over and then uh, or discretion into spending. And then these days it's, you know, um, shifting priorities um, given uh, the lean budget. Um, it is, you know, what do we need to spend? So it's that we will do this and not do that. Um, and determining those types of priorities, uh, usually on a daily basis um, with, with our budget. So now let's talk a little bit about the benefits of park parks. And so before I get to that and walk through this, um, through this slide, I like to, again, set the table a little bit. Um, I don't want to be talking down to anybody. Uh, you may know these, um, you may know some of these terms, but for those of you who do not, um, just want to make sure that we are on the same page. And so when we're talking about green infrastructure, that's the natural and built green spaces that use nature and natural processes to manage a variety of challenges, including water quality, reducing flood risk, providing wildlife habitat, improving air quality, and now improving human health. Often seen as alternative to gray infrastructure, green infrastructure uses natural features and specialized, specialized materials like green roofs, trees, rain gardens, and permeable pavement to help treat stormwater where it falls, bringing additional environmental health, social and economic benefits to surrounding communities. And so gray infrastructure refers to constructed structures such as treatment facilities, sewer systems, stormwater systems, or storage basins. The term gray, as you may imagine, refers to the fact that such structures are often made of concrete. From an economic standpoint, we know that parks improve the quality of life in communities and also contribute to the economic development of an area. A recent NRPA survey notes that three quarters of corporate executives rate quality of life features as important factors when choosing a location for a headquarters, factory, or other company facilities. We know that parks spur tourism to their respective locales, generating significant economic activity. We also know that parks can reduce the costs associated with flood damage to property and keep water off sports fields and other parks, park amen, amenities, excuse me. Economic research has demonstrated consistently that homes and properties located near parkland have higher values than those farther away. We know that parks promote improved physical and mental health by providing more opportunities for physical activity and a great setting to help people recover from mental fatigue. 
both of which have been essential in 2020. As many of you all um, know, the park system during our pandemic has never closed, particularly our open spaces, our um, parks in general, our trails, golf courses, um, and greenways have not closed. And we have had overwhelming, um, overwhelming response from the public and about uh, letting us know how pleased they are that we have kept those open. Then there's the social benefits of parks. Green infrastructure can provide benefits to communities that help increase the bonds between community members, strengthen relationships and promote healthy lifestyles by creating safer spaces and close knit and engaged communities. The environmental benefits of parks are critical. They basically are um, linked to sustainability. They include healthier air, reduced flooding, cleaner water and cooler air. The economic, health, social, and, envir and environmental impacts of parks is undeniable. And that is why we say parks are essential. And here's something that I think um, you as elected officials um, might find interesting. A recent study by NRPA, the National uh, Recreation and Parks Association, found that 95% of government officials are park users and 99% agree that their communities benefit from a park or a park amenity in their area. So. For me, when I saw that metric, that was no shock to me. We have always known and always, we have always known um, and always heard from the public and our, our public officials how much parks are beloved in our community. Local government officials also say that their parks department is a solution to some of the top issues facing their communities like youth crime and promoting quality of life, but are less likely to view parks as a contribution to their number one concern, attracting and retaining businesses. That's interesting. And while six and seven elected officials agree that parks are well worth the tax dollars spent on them, they indicate that when cities face budgetary pre pressures, it's parks departments that are likely to suffer the largest cut in funding. Clearly there is a disconnect and tough choices have to be made. So now let me get into our department specifically and talk about some of the programs, services and amenities that we offer. Our community recreation team is extensive with 10 regional centers, 16 neighborhood centers, one senior center, one indoor tennis center, six indoor pools, three seasonal outdoor pools, a first tee golf program at Vinny Lynx Golf Course, and a cultural arts program. The cultural arts program includes music, dance, fine arts, and theater. Our community centers offer a diverse range of programming for people of all ages. We offer after school and summer enrichment program, programming, as well as grab and go lunches for those who need them. This year, we've opened neighborhood centers on Saturdays to answer community demand. And I just want to say uh, thank you to, to Metro Council, to you all council members, for uh, appropriating that funding. We have, um, again, it's, we opened, I think October 5th, about a week ago, um, our first Saturday and have not been able to open all of the neighborhood community center centers, but that is our goal. Hopefully we'll move forward um, in this uh, difficult fiscal environment, move forward and be able to open those and offer, offer those services and programs to the community, but thank you nonetheless. Our community centers offer a, I'm oh, sorry, our cultural arts programming, 
There we go. Our cultural arts programming encompasses popular summer concerts like the Big Band Dances and Dragon Music Sundays, arts exhibits and classes, theatrical performance, theatrical performances, excuse me, as well as dance. Our dance team is filming this year's mini Nutcracker performance, which many of you know is a Nashville tradition. And that they are filming it uh, as a response to uh, COVID-19 in an abundance, out of an abundance of safety. I expect that'll be a wonderful performance. Consolidated maintenance. I know that many of you may have called on our consolidated maintenance team many times to address anything from a fallen tree or a malfunctioning water fountain. Our consolidated, consolidated maintenance team has four units that consist of grounds maintenance, construction, or facilities, our landscaping section, and our custodial section. The construction group, uh, our ground crew, is responsible for maintaining and repairing athletic fields, picnic shelters, playgrounds, trash collection, restrooms, and mowing of grounds. Our grounds crews mow over 4,000 acres per month. Our facilities group is organized. Let's see. Our facilities group is organized into, into the traditional trade areas of carpentry, masonry, electrical, plum, electrical plumbing, painting, and HVAC. This team is best described as a small construction and repair company that can address most of the issues that occur in our buildings and parks. The landscaping crew maintains all of the shrubs and flowers and flower beds in parks, which is about 13 acres, 600 downtown planters, 1,273 downtown trees, six fountains, 20 irrigation systems covering 60 acres and four green roofs. Landscaping also manages a greenhouse that will grow 140,000 flowers annually. Also, part of this team is the tree crew. And just as a note, this landscaping crew also handles the, um, the city's holiday tree. Uh -oh. Our custodial team is responsible for cleaning and sanitizing all of the facilities in parks. This is performed through both full-time staff and outside contractors. This team usually works late at night after most facilities are closed or very early in the morning before they open. Now, this is the appropriate slide. Our greenways are one of our most popular amenities. Nashville's greenways are based primarily along our eight major waterways, water corridors, the Cumberland River, Stones River, Mill Creek, Seven Mile Creek, Grounds Creek, Whites Creek, and the Harpeth River and in the urban core. Some recently completed projects are the Gulch Greenway at Frankie Pierce Park, Mill Creek Greenway from Mill Creek Park to Orchard Bend Park, Mill Creek Greenway at Mill Creek Park Low Water Pedestrian Bridge, Browns Creek at Fair Park, and Stones River Greenway. A quarter mile connector from Park Haven to Ravenwood Park. More about Greenway. Our outdoor recreation and environmental education team includes nature centers and Fort Nagley. Our nature centers are the spot for environmental education in the city and are popular with all ages. Our outdoor recreation team permits and has oversight over kayak and stand-up paddleboard outfitters that use Metro Parks locations for water access of the Cumberland River. During the summer, they primarily focus on community center youth programming. Too far ahead, sorry about that. 
Our planning team as project managers coordinate the development of parks and parks facilities. Projects range from community centers, dog parks, sports fields, playgrounds, uh, to historic building restoration and site master planning. This is a picture here of um, one of the projects that is about complete. Um, and some of you were there. This was for the, this was actually a naming ceremony for Cossie Gardner Senior Park on Jefferson Street. And again, I think we are nearing um, completion of that park and look forward to um, a ribbon cutting um, in the next few weeks. Our parks police team help ensure that the city's parks and greenways remain safe for everyone. They responded to more than 2,100 calls for service last year. They work very closely with our special events team who permit festivals, concerts, marathons, and other events in our parks. As you can see, uh, again, I'll just say that we all know 2020 has been an anomaly for us all. But if you look at the break breakdown there on the screen, 54% of the events uh, in parks are in neighborhood parks, 19% in downtown parks, and 25% of all events are held in Centennial Park. Our revenue generating team operates most revenue producing facilities and programs, which include our golf courses, Centennial Sportsplex, the Parthenon, Two Rivers Mansion, Wave Country, Hamilton Creek Marina, Cumberland Park Spray Grounds, the East and West Bank Docks at the riverfront, and the permitting of sports fields, picnic shelters, outdoor fitness and model airplanes. They also operate our disabilities program. A disabilities program is a supervised recreation program for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which we have had for more than 40 years. With that, I think I flew through this pretty quickly, uh, council member memories. But with that, I am ready for um, any questions I do have. I'll just say I do have um, some teammates who are in the meeting with me and I'd like to introduce them just in case we have questions that uh, cover their areas. We have Rick Taylor, who is assistant director for the Consolidated Maintenance Division. Cindy Harris, assistant director for Greenways and Open Space, Tim Nage, Assistant Director for our Planning and Facilities Development Division, Stevon Nellums, uh, Assistant Director for Community Recreation Programs and Cultural Arts, and Jackie Jones, who is our Director of Community Affairs. With that, we are ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. If you want to um, your presentation yeah. uh, off, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Those uh, participating uh, on the WebEx, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question, I'm more than happy to do that uh, and facilitate uh, a little bit of the q and I did want to uh, personally, uh, Monique, if you could mute for a second. I, okay. um, it, I want to personally thank um, the Parks Department and everyone that is engaged uh, with keeping uh, our community thriving in the age of COVID. And I know that um, a lot of things have changed, but if it, one thing is I think held true is that we learned in the spring and summer that uh, Nashville understands the importance of, of parks and greenways. And uh, I know that it's something that we want to continue to uh, amplify. And I've got a question from Mr. Bradford, uh, Council Member Bradford. You can unmute and speak. That'd be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question comes from uh, your cost expenditures. Have you looked into what it would cost or what it would take to upgrade all your structures to 
solar in order to save on electric bills? I don't have that number now, but I do know that we are participating with general services to start that process of looking at um, making our buildings um, uh, more, um, what am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, Environmentally friendly. Thank you. Envi I was looking for a word with conservation, sorry, energy conservation, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, we have started the process with um, general services. I think um, maybe four of our facilities, this is the pilot year, and more, four of our facilities are participating in that. So that is the, the direction that we're looking in. Um, and would you also, depending if this does work out and you expand it, will you be also like picnic structures and whatnot, putting solar on those to utilize as much surface as possible? I think we do what what is most feasible um, and and what is um, not only economically feasible, but you know, in terms of community recreation, what what works with the community. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. I know that um, with Music City Solar um, having community solar available, I know that uh, General Services has uh, purchased, if you will panels in that community park. And so um, even trying to see whether or not additional um, community solar uh, would be available for this use might be an idea as well. Um, I have council member Hancock. Uh, do you have a question? Feel free. Thank you, Honorable Van Rees. I have four. Do you want me to just do one and let other people have a turn? We'll do one and a follow-up and they'll swing back. <laughs> okay, super, super. Um, so one question I have is um, if you could address the concern about land donations. I know that we love land and we don't want to sell off land, but I know with limited budget, um, we need to keep that in mind when we're accepting land donations. And then the other question I had is about pools. Um, do we have a map? It's probably online of the distribution of pools so that we could see where they are and are they distributed kind of evenly, do you think? Thank you. Uh, thank you for touching on the land donation piece because um, you're right. We love land. We love to conserve land, but we also have to balance that and keep in mind our um, limitations as a department to care for certain properties. So um, if something, if a property is being donated, uh, we would hope that it did not come with um, a maintenance burden. If it is uh, landlocked and something that we could um, hold on to maybe for future development, that would be lovely. But you, you hit the nail on the head with limited resources, that is people power and, and money. Um, there's only so much that we can do. And our, our department, is, as you all well know, as council people, is um, very spread very thinly. Our resources are spread very thinly now. Um, and so, um, again, we appreciate land, but that we need to be mindful of um, any kind of obligations or deliverables that come with accepting land donations. Um, in terms of pools, I believe a listing of our where our uh, public pools are um, is online. And I, um, I believe they're in pretty much area each area of town. Yeah, not not the outdoor pools. I will say that uh, I think we have three seasonal outdoor pools, um, and one is at Easley, one's at Cleveland, um, and one is at Luby. So those are um, southeast and east, southeast and, and north Nashville. So, yeah. We have one at Peeler Park you could renovate if you had an you know, exorbitant <laughs> amount of funding. <laughs> well, I will tell you, quite honestly, uh, while um, we love pools, we know that they are one of the most expensive features of any, um, any park lo location or community center. They are very, very expensive. Um, so um, we may want to back off the pools just a little, <laughs> little bit for now. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. I know that uh, former council member Pridemore worked really hard trying to get a pool in that center. So 
Um, shout out to, to uh, Council Member Hancock for picking up that torch. Uh, I know that there may be opportunities, hopefully in the future, for more splash pads. So at least you have a water resource, so we'll see how that, that goes. Um, former Chair uh, Angie Henderson, uh, Council Member Henderson, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Odom. I am just, I'm looking back at uh, your budget book and looking at the distribution of your staff and how much uh, you have in kind of seasonal, part-time, temporary, a lot of folks in your maintenance group, and looking at kind of at the management level of planning and uh, kind of, you know, the proactive piece of trying to implement the plan to play master plan and with you know project work and so forth, um, can you tell me how many people you have in your planning division and in kind of greenways and open space? Like how many staff you have there? Because that's not necessarily called out in the, the budget book breakdowns. Right. We have two positions in greenways and open space, and we have four positions in planning and facilities development. Okay. And then, um, Director Odom, I know the returning council members, we were all kind of here for, uh, you know, National Next right before we came into office and in motion, walking by strategic plan, plan to play master plan. We did a lot of planning um, as, a, as a city, and I think we all got a little bit of maybe even planned fatigue. Um, but uh, one of the things that I'm hopeful um, is that we are still working from those plans, right? A lot of community energy and staff time goes into these plans. Um, and I feel like historically in Nashville with administration changes and otherwise, we kind of shelve the plan and we're not really working the plan. Um, and so I wondered from your perspective as director, uh, whether it's uh, you know revenue generating or some of the challenges, I mean, is there anything in the plan for you as director that's really kind of top of mind. I know these pandemic times are maybe shift things a little bit, but um, what do you think from an implementation standpoint, not just really on the capital physical side of things, but um, you know, if there's anything that you wanna share uh, that you're hoping to implement from those uh, that strategic plan. Um, thank you for, for that question, um, Council Member Henderson. And as you know, Plan to Play is a, um, a wealth of um, recommendations for, for the park system. And so what that includes, as, as you know, is what has to be kind of a perfect storm of opportunity, funding, community engagement, and political will. And one of the one of the things and most salient recommendations, I think, in uh, Plan to Play um, speaks to um, a, a new funding model for the for the department. Uh, we, as you know, um, um, we receive an annual appropriation every year. Um, it is not nearly enough. I guess probably every department would say that. Um, every park system across this country would probably say that. But then to look at some unique ways of um, new revenue streams or at least retaining some revenue um, at the department level to assist with um, deferred maintenance and upkeep. And I'll, I'll just take this opportunity too to, to also share that for me, while it is wonderful that we, um, we add new spaces or new facilities um, to our park system, it is, I think, um, more of a responsibility of ours to be able to take care of what we already have to, and to take care of it and maintain it well. And that means um, in, an investment. That means investments, both on the operating side and the capital side. Um, so those are priorities, particularly of mine. I mean, I have other priorities, but in terms of getting our system to where it is um, stabilized and sustainable um, and that we are not, um, you know, constantly um, running behind it is a primary goal of mine. And I think that probably will take um, um, other sources of revenue to get there. Okay, and just by way of, of follow up then on the kind of the proposals about shifting uh, the the revenue 
model or just I, I'm not necessarily shifting it, but um, implementing some other opportunities. Do you feel, do you have somebody on staff who specifically assigned to do that? Is there somebody in the mayor's administration that's looking at that? Um, so, I mean, I, I see that likewise as a, as a real priority and I just wonder how we all can collectively kind of work to effectuate that. I think there will be a conversation with, um, again, all of us, a finance, the finance department and the administration. Um, we do have our finance staff here, um, but given um, our financial state, Metro's financial state right now, I think that's a bit of a, a back burner issue for now, but I do see uh, in the foreseeable future that us uh, starting that discussion and moving toward um, looking at creative ways that we can get more revenue to the department. Okay, and your finance staff then, so I asked about Greenways and Open Space was two, four planning staff, and your finance staff is, is how many? Uh, so we have a, am I on? Yeah. a finance and administration staff, I'm sorry, and it is, uh, let me see, one, two, about six or seven people. Finance and administration um, encompasses, of course, budgeting, um, our accounting staff, um, human resources and payroll, and also our uh, storeroom that we have here, and safety. And, so, and do you have a directive from the mayor's administration on that revenue side, somebody who's charged with working on that, or are you looking to the mayor's administration to advance something for y'all's consideration? I would initiate that conversation, and I have not with them just yet. Okay, thank you, Director Owen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Henderson. I can always uh, count on you for a thorough evaluation. And um, my time served on this committee with you as chair was uh, uh, inspirational. And I hope all of you to, uh, to follow in, in those good footsteps. I know that uh, Council Member Hager, I don't see him on the line as well. He uh, really made an excellent pivot for us last year. And uh, I know that uh, in his stead, uh, we'll continue to, to ask uh, for help in Old Hickory. Uh, and I, I know that that's something that, that uh, he's like a, a dog with a bone, as we all should be uh, in regard to our districts. Um, but I'll, I'll speak, speak out loud for him since he's not here today. Um, one thing that, that I've had some success with a uh, committee that, um, and I'd like to, uh, to bring Tim Nation for a minute to, um, uh, in, in some of the things happening in District Day, my frustration of not being able to find, uh, obviously, new funding for even things like pocket parks has been working with the nonprofit um, sector and with the for-profit sector um, to uh, present to them opportunities that benefit their employees or um, raise their property um, uh, values by a park being nearby. And so um, I encourage uh, people uh, on this call and other council members to continue to be uh, creative in those uh, conversations. Uh, for example, the park behind the Madison Library, I know we've been working with uh, the um, Civic Design Center and the Memorial Foundation uh, for the uh, pocket park that we hope to see uh, behind uh, the hospital on Skyline Ridge Drive. We're working with um, LDG who's building the apartments that would be across the street, as well as HCA Hospital, uh, trying to get other people to put um, some skin in the game. And so um, I wanted to kind of ask uh, uh, Tim his um, uh, experience in those situations, what we can uh, learn as far as best practices in those uh, types of opportunities, what to look for, what not to uh, to shy away from, <laughs> and um, and just to kind of get a, a general idea as far as planning uh, how uh, we as council members with lofty ideas uh, can bring to you those ideas in, in a doable fashion. Um, Mr. Nash. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the, the opportunity to speak. And Cindy Harrison and, of course, Monique may, may have some thoughts on this as well. Um, but, you know, particularly when a developer is um, 
uh, looking to um, looking for a zone change or or some other or a variance or something that uh, gives you um, leverage um, a, a bargaining chip. Um, there is opportunity to engage them um, on the possibility of, of making additional contributions to the community in a park. Um, and we're always happy to, to work with any of you on um, ideas that, that you have or that uh, maybe your constituents have generated in the community about either potential um, park sites or potential improvement projects in parks. We, especially these days, we work very hard to try to manage people's expectations just because uh, resources are so limited. Um, but, um, uh, you know, some, it's got to start with a, with a good idea somewhere. So um, we're always happy to have those conversations. And um, I don't, I, Cindy, I don't know if you have anything to add about, um, you know, leveraging private sector funds, particularly from developers. Well, but thank you. Um, what we've found recently, especially, is that developers are realizing the mutual benefit of open space. And for me in particular, I, I'm developing greenways, but parks, certainly traditional parks are part of that. Um, so we're seeing more and more cooperation and some really um, successful projects. Uh, another avenue for that is to develop policy that um, helps us get that cooperation without having to make it an individual conversation every time a new development comes in. Um, those are, I, th I think that's gonna be the future for us is trying to, to make green space, connectivity, parks, open space, part of the whole approval process of the development and base that on a, a good master plan, which we have. I am swinging back to council member Hickok. What was your other question? Uh, thank you so much. So revenue, I love revenue. And um, I was just curious, you mentioned the model airplanes. Again, you know, Keeler Park being the closest proximity to my home has model airplanes. Do any other parks? Um, another source of revenue that's not direct revenue but could still benefit the parks is Friends of Shelby and Friends of Warner Park. And I've had several people approach me about um, wanting to start Friends of Peeler Park, wondering how you feel about that, as well as um, a few farmers have approached me and wondered if we ever thought about leasing some of the land, some of the fields that are you know, sitting there and don't have greenways on them um, and being willing to not only pay to lease some of the land, but also use that as educational opportunities for school children for Metro Nashville. And so all of those ideas, just want to throw a match it and see what you think. Um, thank you so much for, for those ideas. Um, but we always welcome um, friends support and community support groups because uh, without our friends and um, friends groups and support groups in the community and just individual advocates, we couldn't do what we do. So we lean heavily um, lots of times on the support, the advocacy, the fundraising piece um, from friends groups. Um, in terms of um, leasing property, um, that's an idea. I, I'd have to give that some thought. We haven't um, thought about that in this particular area at Peeler Park, uh, but we're always interested in um, land conservation and then ed education, uh, environmental education. So that piece is already built into to the system. So anyway, thank you for those ideas. Again, we're always interested um, in those organizations or groups of folks who want to um, form support organizations that we do have a, um, a friends group policy here in the department as a process to be recognized by the parks board. It is not cumbersome at all. Um, but we again, welcome all who want to come and support the park system. And then are there other model airplane flying parks or is it just oh, I'm sorry, Cane Ridge. Okay. 
And, and what are the fees and, and what is the total? I have to get back with you on the fees. Okay. I don't know the exact fee. I'll, I'll get that for you. And are these sort of things, this and the golf course, are these sort of things you would like us to promote to help drive, even if it's a small amount of revenue, or do they just kind of take care of themselves? I think a lot of them take care of themselves, in particular golf, because people love our golf courses. Again, I'll just go back to even before COVID, people were enjoying our golf courses and parks in general. Um, but it doesn't hurt to promote any uh, promotion that uh, you can do on behalf of Metro and Metro Parks, welcoming folks to those uh, facilities to enjoy those programs. We'd love that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. I know that um, we just have about uh, 10 minutes left in our hour. Um, I did want to, to bring out uh, both the uh, Parks Foundation and the Trees Foundation and how they continue to collaborate with Metro Parks and all of us in a variety of different ways. And if you as a council member haven't reached out to those uh, foundations, both Greenways, Trees, uh, Parks Foundations, um, that you get to know them and find out ways that you can collaborate uh, with them and to be involved. Um, one of the, the things, and we don't have much time, uh, but I know that um, in your presentation, um, Chair Odom, that the, um, uh, the, you had a slide about the, the rename and the naming of that park. And I know that there's um, a handful of ideas um, going to both the policy committee and the parks renaming committee to try to get uh, requests in, in a way that um, is, uh, uh, makes sense along the way. And um, there are a couple of different um, opportunities that are presenting themselves now. Could you could you give us a, just a quick update um, as to where all that that lies and what we can be looking forward to um, in regard to the current policy and procedure on those types of requests? Sure. In regard to the um, request that came forward from. Um, Council Member Hurt and the Minority Caucus to rename Hadley Park, uh, Freedom Riders Park. Um, at the last Parks Board meeting or naming committee, there was a, a recommendation and um, approval to move forward in looking at the naming policy itself. So in just to go back just a little bit, um, in terms of renaming Hadley Park, the steps involved with that would be an approval from the Parks Board, which would basically serve as a recommendation to the State Historical Commission um, to rename this the park. Um, and then Metro would need to file a petition with the state um, to, to requesting to rename Hadley Park. Um, Hadley Park, because it is named for a historical figure, um, falls under the Heritage Protection, Tennessee Heritage Protection Act. And so um, that is how that uh, process would proceed. Would proceed. Um, I expect that the next um, naming committee in November and naming slash policy committee um, in November for uh, those committees to meet and uh, chart a way forward um, with directly related to the request uh, to rename Hadley Park. Uh, we do not want it to be a, a protracted um, process, but um, short, um, I think it's uh, been with those committees for quite some time. So we want to um, move forward in an expedient manner. Um, in terms of um, any other requests coming forward, particularly just say for uh, Public Square Park, um, to my knowledge, that would not require um, state approval to be just parks board approval to move forward with that. Uh, th thank you for, for that quick update. Um, I, uh, I have a committee I've asked Metro historic to do a complete report, um, to offer to the committee, uh, an analysis, um, both, uh, from, uh, this committee as well as the minority caucus to consider, um, the renaming of public square to Diane Nash and uh, just to get an opinion on it. Um, and so uh, in the months of November and December, we'll see kind of what that opinion is and then open it up for public comment 
uh, before um, uh, any recommendation for the board to proceed. But with those two things coming up in particular, um, uh, I wanted to make sure that since we had you on, on the line, we'll talk to you in this format again until January, uh, that we put on the record that those are things that are coming up. Um, I really appreciate uh, the overview. I do look forward in January to getting um, uh, more uh, feedback from you in regard to even some stories perhaps from each of these departments. Um, uh, bring, bring folks with you um, to talk about um, what it means to have uh, a, a place to be after school, what it means uh, to have a place to um, clear your head and walk around. Um, let's, let's, let's focus January on parks in regard to that community value, um, if you will. And, um, and yes, you've got the last part. I just wanted to say one more thing. I wanted to thank you, um, you, uh, Council Member Van Rees and committee for having us um, today and want, as you talked about, um, stories that exist here in the Parks Department. I hope you all uh, want to encourage you to um, each month or a couple of times a month when you get our newsletters to make sure that you look at the stories in those newsletters. They often involve um, people in the community um, in your area, your districts that are using um, Metro Parks and or employees in this department who um, usually don't get the opportunity to have the light uh, shine on them, and we want to make sure that they know that they are valued and appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, everybody be, uh, continue to look at our mailboxes, get full really quickly. Uh, look, just look through that newsletter, find one thing you want to put in your own newsletter. Let's, let's share the word. Um, thank you so much, and everybody, uh, please in, enjoy the rest of the evening, and we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.